5.3%, uh, whereas I think California went way up, Texas went way up, um, et cetera, which was, again, a, a direct result of Reagan's um, economic policies. And as I'm suggesting, deregulation in the communication industry allowed these big corporations to take over the television networks and to advance a conservative uh, Republican um, um, agenda. So you see why the uh, television uh, networks would be friendly to uh, Reagan. He totally deregulated. He gave them big tax breaks so that they could, you know, pocket their seven and six figure uh, salaries and only give a small share to uh, taxes. He allowed the networks to own many more stations and thus take in uh, much more uh, money. He allowed um, them to more or less broadcast what they want. There'd be no uh, requirements. They could have as much advertising and commercialism as uh, they wanted. He pretty much gave them a free hand. There's one thing that Reagan did not give the television stations, and it's my theory that this is why they decided to line up strongly behind Bush, because they thought that Bush might give them this real benefit that uh, Reagan uh, wouldn't and that the Democrats probably wouldn't. And that is the end of the so-called FinCEN rules, the financial interest in syndication. Again, the networks never cover this stuff, so you probably never heard of this. This is probably all mumbo jumbo. But in the 1970s, under the FCC, under Nixon, television networks were no longer able to produce television programs, okay? The Cosby Show, Family Ties, all of the entertainment television are produced by Hollywood studios, okay? That the government claimed that the networks had a monopoly. They controlled news production, entertainment production, and that we needed to diversify this so we needed to let Hollywood production studios uh, produce uh, television. Moreover, the networks not only couldn't produce this stuff, they couldn't syndicate it. The, the companies that made Cosby, for instance, could sell it for reruns. They could syndicate it around the country. They could sell it to Europe, to the third world, and get mega billions of uh, dollars. Well, more and more, there's a big uh, market for um, US television programming abroad and more and more money in the syndication um, um, domain. Um, for instance, uh, in 1984, US programs accounted for 70%, 5% of the $4 million in the international marketplace. By the end of the decade, US program distributors were taking in more than 1.3 billion from program sales. And it was predicted that by 1992, U.S. distributors would be taking in more than $3.6 billion in television sales abroad. In other words, there was billions and billions of dollars that the television networks could make if they could produce television programs and then syndicate them and uh, sell them abroad, whereas now the Hollywood studios, the Cosby Group, the Norman Lear Group, Mary Tyler Moore Group, these are the ones that were getting this gigantic bonanza that's going to double, triple, quadruple in years to come because European uh, markets are opening up to American exports and all over the third world. Well, why didn't Reagan allow these people to, um, why didn't he allow the financial interest in syndication rules to be rescinded? Because his buddies and pals were in the Hollywood production uh, community. His Hollywood friends called Ron and said, Ron, if you do away with this uh, rules, Hollywood's going to be destroyed. All your friends are going to lose money. They're going to be out of business. The whole town will go down the tubes. This will just make New York the entertainment capital of the world where all the networks uh, are. So you can't let them do this, OK? Well, uh, they were hoping that George Bush uh, will. That this would be, a, again, a multi-billion dollar uh, bonanza that would um, accrue to the television networks if these financial interests and syndication rules were thrown away. So my guess is that this is a strong reason why the networks went behind uh, Bush. Plus, they thought Bush would continue to give them tax breaks. Plus, he would continue deregulation. So it was really in the interest of the networks to support Bush, and I'm suggesting they did. 
Now you might ask, what is, what, so what's the big deal about this? You know, aren't the television interest uh, corporations just businesses? Shouldn't they be allowed to make as much money um, as they want? Don't we have freedom of speech in this country? Shouldn't uh, G be able to allow to get its point of view across and if it can buy a television network? What's wrong with that, you may ask, if you've been indoctrinated by the uh, Reagan uh, ideology of the last decade? Well, in point of fact, the way that the communication system was set up in the United States was that broadcasting is a public utility that's to be dictated by the public interest, convenience, and necessity. Todd Gitlin mentioned this at the end of his remarks or during the discussion section the other night, that the Federal Communication Act designated in the 1930s that the broadcasting networks w must uh, broadcast in the public interest, showing all sides of a question. There was a fairness doctrine that they had to cover each side from different uh, points of uh, view, and the television is part of the public sphere. It's not part of the private sphere. As part of the public sphere, like the telephone companies, um, the waterways, the highways, it's supposed to be regulated by the government. In other words, the government has an obligation to regulate television because it's a part of the public sphere, because it's supposed to operate in the uh, public um, interest. And I'm suggesting it's a crisis of um, democracy that um, this is no longer the case, that it's purely private. Well, unfortunately, I've done what uh, usually happens in these cases, and that is I, went, I spent all my time on the uh, negative side of the uh, story. I was supposed to tell you about the positive side, which I'm going to tell you very uh, briefly. I just looked at my watch. I didn't know I'd rambled on uh, for so long about the magnitude of the crisis of democracy because the major corporations have taken over the television networks that are not serving the interests of democracy, but are the, serving the interests of their corporate owners. So what can we do about this, you, I hope, would want to uh, ask. And I argue there's uh, three things, basically, that we can do to save our uh, system, to save our um, democracy. One is to reinvigorate public television. I've got figures in my uh, paper that I don't have time to read that indicates something like in 1988, the United States spent 74 cents per person on public television. In uh, Japan, they spend something like $10 per person. In uh, Canada, something like $20. In Britain, something like $28. So in other words, every single country in the world invests in public television infinitely more than the United States. Well, you might be worried about public television. Do we want the state to have uh, more uh, power? They'll just use it for uh, propaganda. Well, it's a misnomer that the um, only options for a, a broadcast system would be a state controlled as in the Soviet Union and communist countries or a corporation controlled as in uh, the United States. Countries like Holland, West Germany, uh, Britain, they have public television that is not owned by the state, but there's a public body that's funded with public money that involves representatives from different political parties, from business and labor, from women, from different minorities and ethnicities in the uh, country, intellectuals, religious leaders. And these television uh, boards, the BBC board, the West German board, um, decide what goes on uh, television and use public money to fund a variety and diversity of uh, television uh, programming that represents the viewpoints of all the different groups in the United States. I went to Britain a couple years ago when they were having their labor convention, they, um, the, the trade union convention. They were um, broadcasting this live, just like they do a Republican or Democratic um, convention. At night, their equivalent of Nightline has labor union leaders on there. When have you ever seen a labor union leader on Ted Koppel or Nightline? But they were really giving labor, uh, you know, a fair share of the TV uh, play in uh, Great uh, Britain. Holland has even a better system. They have a certain allocation of time on their public television stations, and whatever political group can get something more more than 60,000 uh, signatures, 60,000 people are members of a, a, a group. They get a certain amount of time on the free time on the public.
television specter to get their views out, to broadcast what they want to the uh, uh, people. So it's a scandal that we don't have better television, public television. It would be easy to get it. You could tax um, the profits of uh, television networks. You could tax the sales of television stations and networks. You could tax advertising. Did you all know that advertising is not taxed in the United States? It's a business write-off. 2% of our gross national product goes to advertising. 2% goes to packaging you know, and marketing stuff. And this is a tax write-off from corporations. They do not pay taxes on advertising expenses. So if you tax this, even in a minuscule percentage, you could fund a public uh, television uh, system. So there's very easy ways to fund public television that's not going to take money out of your uh, pocketbooks. And it, and, but this is never explored by um, the United States. In fact, right now, our public television is controlled by corporations in the state more than any country in the world. Almost every sh uh, PBS program is funded by a big corporation. And look at the talk shows you got on PBS. You've got William Buckley, a right winger, going for about 20 years strong. This John McLaughlin, another conservative uh, discussion um, show. You've got all these business shows. You've got Adam Smith's Money Market. You've got the Nightly Business Report. Do you have any labor shows on PBS? Do you have any progressive shows? Do you have any public interest shows? Do you have any feminist shows? Any socialist shows? No way. It's again, the conservatives are controlling even public television in the United States, and this isn't fair. However, I personally believe that my second proposal is really the best in order to democratize television, and that's public access television. For the last 12 years, I've been doing a public access program, Alternative Views, in um, Austin, uh, Texas. And what we basically do is to bring on all the progressives that come into town. We have John Stockwell criticizing the CIA. He's been here um, a couple times. We have George Wald talking about, and Helen Caldicott talking about environmental uh, crisis. We have representatives from uh, Nicaragua and El Salvador Liberation Fronts coming and talking uh, to us. I just interviewed two days ago um, um, a cardinal who'd run for president of uh, Mexico, giving his views on Mexican-U.S. relations and what his program was to democratize Mexico. We just had a two-part series on the savings and loan crisis with an investigator. We just did a two-part series on the Kennedy assassination, another major scandal where it's totally known, the whole story of who assassinated Kennedy and how it worked, which the mainstream media has uh, kept off. So we've been doing this now for 12 years. We're, we're shown, by the way, in Ames, I'm told, that we're on the public access system in Ames. So what you should do is to call your cable system ask for the access manager and ask uh, when is alternative views on the uh, cable system. Has anyone seen this uh, TV show? You would see my face on it because I'm one of the people that do the uh, um, interviews. And I'm, well, I'm also told that there's a, a progressive peace and justice coalition that has a TV show here in Ames where television is being used to criticize the government to provide alternative um, information, uh, to present the views of public interest groups, of um, alternative political positions, feminists, uh, black liberationists, uh, gay liberationists, whatever. All of these views are left out of mainstream media, but all of these are accessible to public access television. We have the best system, of course, in uh, Austin, Texas. We've won several awards as having the best uh, access uh, system. And again, every progressive group in town has their own TV show. So that there is a way to use television f uh, for uh, public enlightenment, to uh, promote discussions of uh, ideas, to make television an instrument of progressive social change. Now, since I'm a bit of a utopian, having written a book on Herbert Marcuse, um, I have a final proposal of how we can democratize uh, our uh, communication system, and that is to use the most advanced technologies for democratic communication. And I'm talking about satellite television, and I'm talking about computer networks, okay? The government sends up these satellites, okay? Your tax-paying money um, is used to set up these satellites. They haven't had very good luck getting them up recently, but for a while they were actually uh, <laughs> shooting them up pretty regularly, and you'd have, and I have a satellite dish at home, and there's something like 24 of these satellites 
most of whose transponders aren't even used for commercial networks. Well, the government, since, again, it's our taxpayers' that money that put all this stuff up, could shoot up a people's satellite, okay, that would be used for 24 channels for a people's television network so that every group in society, the Democrats, the Republicans, the Libertarians, the Socialists, the Anarchists, the Feminists, the Blacks, the Hispanics, the Gays, uh, the Native Americans, the Farmers, the uh, whatever category you have, even maybe professors, let them have a say. We've been pretty marginalized in this uh, society. Have an intellectual uh, network. Uh, this would be easy to do uh, in terms of uh, technology and you could uh, mandate that at least one of these public interest channels would be picked up by every cable system in the country. Well, that means that 60 to 70 percent of the people would get this people's network because something like 60 to 70 percent of the country have uh, satellites. Uh, the two or three million people that have home satellite dishes could pick up all kinds of stuff uh, from there. By the way, another uh, big thing that happened under the Reagan years was the killing of the satellite industry. I bought a satellite dish and I had Media Utopia for about three or four months where you could get every single um, um, television movie channel for free. You got all these pornography channels, all these right-wing religion channels, uh, every single sports event you can imagine. You could pick up on the uh, satellite, you could get uh, live news coverage you could see the network shooting their stuff up, the live news feeds to the satellite. Uh, you could um, hear Johnny Carson telling dirty jokes uh, when the ads were being played on the uh, Tonight Show. So it was really a gas to have a, a satellite dish. Then they started scrambling. Again, the FCC basically let you know, the corporations do what they want, wanted to, but the cable industry had a lot of clout. So they owned a, enough congressmen to allow these different uh, cable networks like the USA Network, HBO, that started it, to start scrambling their uh, 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 programming. So uh, then you had to buy an expensive decoder and pay more money than you'd have to pay to belong to a cable system to get this stuff off of the uh, satellite. So this killed the satellite industry. I mean, this was like the most advanced technology. Uh, the prices of satellites were going down to conceivably a few hundred dollars. So just like everyone now practically owns a VCR, it would be easy to, uh, for everyone to own a satellite dish. But again, because of the scrambling, it makes it economically unfeasible and the satellite industry is going down the uh, tubes. But anyway, this is my utopian idea. We'll have a satellite for the uh, people. And likewise, communication modem uh, networks. Every town should have a people's computer center where people are taught to um, use um, computers, we should be able to like communicate with ourselves on modems so that all the information we get in Austin about the Kennedy assassination, we can feed into a, a modem that uh, Tony can get here in uh, Ames, can print out uh, copies of this and distribute it to uh, you all so that we're sending information all over the uh, country uh, via uh, modem. Some progressive groups are starting to do this, but again, this, this is something that um, more is needed to be done. Well, I ended up not reading my paper and talking off of the uh, top of my head, but let me uh, end on a rhetorical flourish, and I'll read um, the final two um, uh, paragraphs. Again, I've argued that every progressive group should make media politics part of their uh, political agenda, using the media to uh, advance their method, criticizing the media if they're not getting their message across, if you're an environmentalist and the media is distorting the facts about destruction of the environment, you should use television to uh, get it across. So I think the best hope for preserving democracy in the United States depends on progressive public interests and citizens groups and individuals expanding their struggles and using new technologies to increase democratic communication and participation. Some of the new technologies resist centralized control by business or government and give the people new instruments of communication and struggle, computers and public access TV, for instance. The future of democracy depends upon use of new technologies to promote democracy and to counter capitalist control of the state and broadcast media. What we have here really is a contradiction between capitalism and democracy. It's ironic that all over the world you're having 
perestroika, you're having democracy being fought for. And while everyone else in the world is getting more democracy, we're getting less of it in the United States because capitalism is controlling more and more arenas of the state and the uh, media. So therefore, I would argue that ultimately for a democratic, that ultimately, the struggle for a democratic communication system is therefore the struggle for a democratic society. The technologies and possibilities are there. It is a matter of imagination, will, and struggle to realize the democratic potential that still exists in a system organized for the hegemony of capital in an era of conservative rule. Yet liberation from the yoke of capital remains possible, as does the possibility of imagining how a truly democratic society could be organized. Such a vision remains utopian, but in the words of Bertolt Brecht, and with this I close, if you think that this is utopian, then I would ask you to reflect upon why you think this is utopian. Thank you.